hey, do you want to move to Tampa, but you're just not exactly sure how to do it? Then you're going to want to watch this video. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into my channel, Living in Tampa, where it's my goal to show you everything you need to know about eating, sleeping, playing, and living in the greater Tampa Bay area. Hey, if it's your first time to my channel, could you do me a big favor? Hit that subscribe button ring the little bell so you'll be notified every time that I release a new video. So today's video is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be interviewing my mortgage lender that I work with on a regular basis here in the Tampa area. We are going to be going over the ins and outs of how exactly you can make that move from wherever you are to the greater Tampa Bay area. I get so many people calling me every day with questions about moving to Tampa and I absolutely love it. And one of the main questions that I get asked is, how do I actually do this? Like I have a house here, I you know, have a job here, I'm in the process of you know, making that transition and I'm not exactly sure what order the steps I need to take need to be taken in, what makes sense for me, what I can do financially, and just how to go about making it all happen. So we are going to cover all of that today. Let's get started. The two main things that you really need to take into consideration are your mortgage, how you're going to pay for a property, and also, of course, your employment. Now, to me, it definitely makes the most sense from an employment standpoint to be looking for a job before you actually make the move here. Although I do hear from a lot of people that employers are hesitant to hire them if they're having to relocate and that sometimes it's easier to get hired once you're actually in the local area. So there's no like firm answer on how to go about that. You have to kind of do what works best for you in your field. But I would say to explore both options to see if you're able to just make a transfer within your company and stay with the same company, that's fantastic and of course super easy or if you can get hired on by a company that's willing to help you relocate, that's great because a lot of the larger corporations are willing to give you like a relocation package that will include anything from, you know, realtor involvement, like paying realtor fees for you if you're selling a home, um, helping with getting the home listed, um, moving costs, you know, helping when you're buying a home in the new area and all of that can sometimes be included as part of your re relocation package, depending on what company you're working for. Also, another thing to consider might be to see if you could work remotely. Now, ever since this coronavirus, that is one thing that has been a good outcome of this pandemic is that a lot of people are able to continue to work remotely and therefore you can pretty much work wherever in the world you want to. Uh, the catch to that would be if you are getting a mortgage, that is something that you are going to have to have documented from your employer that it is okay for you to continue to work remotely. So that would be another thing to take into consideration. And last but not least, of course, would be going ahead and making the move here, maybe getting into some type of temporary living situation uh, while you look for employment. And once you have secured that employment and have your offer letter and know exactly what your pay is going to be, uh, it might be a little bit easier then to uh, you know, continue with a home purchase. But I would encourage you not to lock yourself into a long lease because that is very confining, very restrictive. And if you do get hired pretty quickly and you end up having to pay rent for an entire year at these inflated rent prices, you're not going to be happy about it. The main topic that I wanna cover in today's video though is how to actually go about financing a home once you move to the Tampa Bay area. Now there's a lot of different ways to do that and that's why I wanted to bring in an expert in that field. So today I'm gonna to have Christine Wilson with me from the mortgage firm and I'm going to be doing this via a Zoom interview with her. I'm going to be asking her a lot of questions that I get from a lot of customers that are making the move and I hope that you're gonna find this useful. So let's get started with that. Okay guys, so here I am with my preferred lender, Christine Wilson with the mortgage firm and she has graciously agreed to give us a few minutes of her time today so we can talk about this uh, issue that I always get asked, I always get asked, how should I go about financing and paying for my property when I'm relocating from another state or even another city to the greater Tampa Bay area? So Christine is going to go over just a few 
alternatives, things that might work for you depending on your situation. And uh, of course, if you need more detail, we're always available just a phone call or an email away and we're happy to help. So the first uh, kind of option that um, people may not be aware of is that you may be able to qualify for a home here, even though you still own a home there. Can you kind of go into that a little bit for me, Christine? Yes, um, we get this so often where people are under the impression uh, they've talked themselves into that they won't qualify um, with the payment counted against them. And it's so interesting. I say, well, let's just try it. Let's just see what the numbers look like. And I would say probably eight times out of 10, they qualify with both payments counted against them. And so um, if that's possible, or maybe we need to add somebody, you know, maybe add the wife or the husband or spouse or something onto the loan where before they didn't have them on the loan. And so we just look at the whole picture. And if you look at the whole picture, it might just qualify and you don't have to worry about it. Now, the time when that you don't qualify with two paying, because there's two ways you have to qualify with your debt to income ratio and you have to qualify with the money coming out of the house. Now, if you need to sell that house in order to get the the money out, then we might have to look at other options to how to get the money out. And then we're going to, you and I will be going through um, some other options on how to get the equity out. But if you have the money already, a lot of times this is the situation. I've had this example happen. They, they know they have about 20% equity to put down on the new house. And they're kind of fixated on making sure that they do the 20%. Um, to put down that when they sell the house and I say, well, do you have 5% in the bank maybe to put down um, instead of the 20% and then we can qualify you on both on both payments? Oh, yeah, because a lot of times, especially in this market with interest rates so low, um, if they talk to their financial advisor, the financial advisor might even say, no, 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 don't put down 20%, put right. down 5% because you're paying such low interest rate and go and invest the money because you're making like six or 7% in the market or whatever it may be. You're making more in the market than you, than you are with the interest rate. True, true. And a lot of people get fixated on that 20% because they want to, you know, avoid that mortgage insurance. Great. Uh, and, and so, but there is a way to get around that later too, right, Christine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I always, I like the 10%. You can pay mortgage insurance upfront, like a one-time upfront fee, instead of paying it on a monthly uh, period of time where it kind of, honestly, it kind of bugs people just to see it on their statement. Right. <laughs> and so... And then, or so you can pay it as an upfront fee. You can also do a lender, um, a lender. It's called lender paid mortgage insurance. So three ways, just to sum that up, you can pay mortgage insurance monthly, um, which most people don't enjoy, but you get the benefit of using that, that extra 15 or 10% money in the, in your bank where you don't have to put it down on the house. Cause once you put it down on a house, it's in the house, it's in that house bank account, which is really hard to get that money back out of. I always tell people, be very careful um, of what you're going to be putting down on the house because it costs a lot of money. It's pretty arduous. I love that word because it says exactly what it, it sounds, exactly how it is. is. And it's very arduous to get your money back out, you know, but when it's in a checking and a savings account, pretty easy to get back out if you need it. True. So true. So yes. And then, so to sum up monthly mortgage insurance, you have, um, it's called upfront mortgage insurance or one time, uh, they can just pay it. It's just a one-time fee. You're just kind of buying out the numbers usually work where you're buying out about three years of worth of monthly mortgage insurance. Those are usually the numbers. Um, and then, then the lender paid mortgage insurance. And you've heard of this maybe where the interest rates higher and they say, oh, there's no mortgage insurance. You put 5% down with no mortgage insurance. The interest rate's just a little bit higher and the lender is paying that upfront mortgage insurance for you. Okay. And so they call it lender paid mortgage insurance where the interest rate's a little bit higher. It's still a great deal. I love, I love all three options for different reasons. That makes sense, yeah. So that's for the people that are able to, you know, have that money down and be able to qualify for both payments and everything like that. For the people that cannot do that, mm -hmm. um, there is another option. And sometimes it's actually more advantageous for people to, while they're still in the state that they're in, 
um, be it California, New York, New Jersey, all the popular places that we've got people moving to Tampa from, they're getting paid sometimes more there than they're going to be paid once they move here a lot of times. So sometimes it makes more sense to go ahead and make that home purchase when they're employed at that previous place. And when they do that, then it's my understanding they would have to finance it as either as a second home or investment property. So right. I was wondering if you could kind of go over those two options, the difference between them and what difference it makes to the buyer. So a second home, yes, they could purchase it wherever they might be as a second home or an investment property. Now, it really has to do with the intent. What is your intent on doing in this house? So, and, and I would say a majority of it is probably going to be a second home. Hey, we really like to come down there. Uh, we want a, a second home in Tampa. We're going to occupy it. Most of the time, we might rent it out every once in a while. But our primary intent is to occupy it as a second home, not to use it as a full-time rental. And so that would be a second home. It requires 10% down. And you do have to qualify with that payment counted against you, the full payment with taxes and insurance and homeowner's insurance if there's an HOA. And then the other option is, um, and the second home interest rates are about the same as primary rates, by the way. And so a, an investment property is you have no intention on occupying this property at any time. You intend 100% to, um, to rent it out, either, um, either on VRBO, short-term rental or something like that, or uh, long-term rental in your lease or th something like that. That's gonna require, uh, well, technically you can put 15% down, but honestly and truly nobody does that. The mortgage insurance is outrageous. You have, it stays on there for the life of the loan. No one does 15% wow. down on an investment property. It does exist. So I don't wanna not ignore it, but most uh, investment properties is a, usually a minimum of 20% down. And you do have to have reserves on both of these. Second and investment properties both require you to have reserves in the bank afterwards. We're not gonna use the money for the down payment, but you have to have some money left over in the bank. I and see. it just depends on how many other rental properties you have and some other numbers like that. Okay, makes sense. Well, that's a good option for people that maybe, you know, are planning to come here later or just, uh, you know, want to go ahead and, and buy the home. Um, I, would say this, I, I would like to put this warning out there. In Florida, our underwriters are smart. And so be very careful because we see this all the time. And I would say, be careful of this. If they, they are of the retirement age and we're using income and they can see that you're purchasing a house in underwriting, the, the income that we're using to qualify people has to be regular and reoccurring and needs to be have a continuance of three years. So I've had this happen before where the underwriter catch wind, catches wind of the um, that they might be retiring next month, oh. you know, or something like where their income is going to end, you know, very soon. And if they catch wind of that um, and they think that the income of that borrower is going to um, be going away at some point in time and they're buying a house down here as a second home or an investment property, then that might be an issue. So I would just have a, a little because that's caught me before and I did not have any idea. And honestly, I didn't even know the 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 client's income was going to change. You know, okay. I had no idea, but they, they're, 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 they, it will come up. They, they do their homework, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. That's good to know for sure. Um, and then another option, like for people that are maybe planning to move, say in a year or two, they maybe have the ability to float both houses, you know, qualify for both, but they need that money out of the house that they're in with the market being what it is. Most of us do have a good chunk of equity in our homes. So what is your recommendation for that? Yeah, so be proactive. That's all I can say. If you're thinking, um, I love a good home equity line of credit. Um, if you have some, if you have good um, equity in your home, you know you have about 100, maybe 200, maybe $300,000 worth of equity in your home, get a home equity line of credit, get it set up. It's usually free or less than $1,000 to, to get it set up. And a home equity line of credit is a credit card against your home. So just like I would advise with any other credit card, keep a zero balance or as low as you possibly can or keep it payoffable. So don't go and charge up on it. But having a nice home equity line of credit that is open and ready to be used is great. And you can use that to, for the down payment of the next house. 
So you can use that. So say you have a, a home equity line of credit just set up on your house, $200,000 home equity credit. Nothing's charged on. It's just sitting there waiting for you to be used. And I think they're with most banks, they're going to charge you maybe a, a yearly fee of like three or 400 bucks to have that open. Mm -hmm. And you can use it for lots of reasons. I just use a home equity line of credit to pay cash for a car because it's ridiculous. I can't believe I just bought a car in this. I can't believe it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's not like they're checking, you know, what you're yeah. using the money for really. Right. Yeah. So you can use a credit line for anything. I just paid cash and then I'll get my car loan later, you know, yeah. so you can use the credit line to get set up. Now, usually you need that credit line set up for about three years, or you're going to have to pay a fee to close it early. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you do close it early, if, or when you think you're going to be closing it out early because you think you're going to be selling the house, then just know what that fee is. It's probably less than $3,000, but man, is that way less expensive than doing what we're going to talk about here in just a minute as a bridge loan. Right. Yeah. And there are restrictions you know, people might be thinking, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to go do that. You can't do that. And then, you know, in a month, put your house on the market. So Correct. you have to yeah. do this well in advance. Yeah, yeah. This is definitely a, hey, I know I'm going to probably be doing something in a year or two or three. And you know what, let's just get a credit line set up, set up. Um, it's just a good idea in general. You know, I, especially if you have already have a good rate, you know, a nice solid rate on the ch big chunk of the first loan of the, and then just go get it set up. I mean, it's pretty, it's so nice to come in and out of it, you know, um, and have that flexibility um, with that. And it's just equity because, you got to think it's a paradigm shift. You got to think your home, you know, we always say your home is your biggest investment, right? Right. It's an investment. It's a bank account. Just like all your money sitting in your 401k is an investment. It's cash sitting there. So it's cash sitting there. <laughs> right. So, so this is a way to get to use that cash, right? Yes. This is just a way to open that up. And it's pretty inexpensive. So you don't have to refinance, do a cash out refi. You can also do a refi cash out. But I would say that is just going to be a little bit more of an expensive way because again, you're gonna to have to pay closing costs on the on that. And that can be a little bit more than than the penalties on a HELOC or doing a home equity line of credit. Right, right. Now, so for those people who didn't think in advance and are just trying to figure out a way just to make this work, there is another option. And you just mentioned it is a lot more expensive, but that would be the bridge loan. Um, and can you, you know, speak a little to that and how that would work? Yep. So a bridge loan is short-term lending. Okay. So you're bridging, you're going to take a loan out uh, on the, the equity of the house um, with all intentions of paying it off within a two to three or one to two to three month period of time. They expect payment on that. On that. So um, they make all their money. They don't make any of the money in interest, as you can imagine, because you, banks make money on monthly interest. And so instead of them making money on monthly interest, they are going to make all their money up front and they're going to charge somewhere. It just depends on the amount, probably somewhere between seven to 10 grand um, wow. to, to have access to that money. Now I've seen this, I've seen it benefit where I've seen this benefit is when they have to take this money out of their investment and they're getting taxed severely. Like, mm -hmm. so they're getting taxed like 20 to 30 grand. Um, they're going to have to pay twenty or thirty thousand dollars in taxes when they take this money out. So instead of taking that money out of their investments, they would rather just do a bridge loan and pay the seven or ten grand. So right. sometimes it makes sense. It just depends on the on the full picture. Right. Right. Yeah. So and then the, the another kind of last resort kind of thing, I guess, would be for most people, because I know most people don't enjoy, you know, asking their families for money, but sometimes you're in a situation where you are able to get a gift from a family member or a close friend. Um, mm -hmm. And this, I guess, would be in that same category as uh, we started with, if they're able to qualify for both homes, but maybe they just don't have that money that they need for the down payment and the closing costs or, you know, things of that nature. So um, with these gifts, is there any kind of limit on the amount that people can get for the gift? And how does it work exactly? All loans you can get, the whole thing can be gifted on every every loan that we've done. Uh, I've not, we don't have any conventional FHA, VA. They have no limits on gifts. The whole thing can be gifted, um, the down payment and the closing costs. Um, so yes, getting a gift. We've seen a lot of this this year. <laughs> a lot of parents coming out of the woodwork and yeah. paying cash because we had to have a lot of cash deals, you know, I mean, cash one. And so 
Um, what what we did a lot of times this year is the the parents would make they would make the offer cash, and then we would come in and try to we'd close that loan within about a three week period of time. And so if we were able to do the loan, obviously they would still pay cash, but we, they didn't want to pay cash. Nobody wants to pay cash whenever you're making pretty good money on your investments and rates are so low. Wow. And so absolutely you can get a gift from, from family either f- to pay cash for the house in general, and then we can refinance it later out of it. Um, and then you can pay them back with the proceeds um, or at, that's really not, um, you don't really want to do that, uh, the refi. Um, the refi is not, I would try to do the purchase on it in, in the meantime, and it's no extra cost to the seller. You know, if you're no, there's no extra cost to the seller, if you're getting a loan. So you make a cash offer and, and, but instead, um, you're going to go ahead and get a loan. The only inconvenience to the seller would be getting an appraisal done. If you, if, if you even needed one, sometimes we get an appraisal waiver on those, you know, cause they have a larger down payment on it. Yeah, we have seen more of those. And I'm going to spring one last one on you that just kind of got my wheels turning while we were talking here. If if people aren't able to get the gift, sometimes people can take money out of their um, 401k or- um, Good one. I actually thought about it when we were up here and I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, people forget that they have a 401k that they can borrow against and they can pay it back when they sell the house. You know, and so I always tell people you need to call your 401k and ask them how much you have. But yeah, those have been saving graces is the 401k is just sitting there and um, and and they and they didn't even think about that they could borrow against it and um, and then pay it back. But they need to call their they need to call because everyone's 401k is set up differently. So, right. so there may be penalties. Call. There may be, yeah. you know, other things. So that's definitely something people have to investigate on their own. But it's it's just something. Uh, you know, another way to kind of make this all work because everyone's situation is unique and we can't speak to everyone's situation, but we wanted to kind of go over the main ways that do make it possible to go ahead and move forward with purchasing a home here, um, even though you may not have sold your residence. Well, I have time to bring in another one. I'll spring another one on you. Yeah, let's do one more. So (laughs) one more is especially because, um, because of the, uh, when you're over the age of 59 and a half, you can have access to your, um, your, uh, to set up monthly distributions of your retirement funds, monies that were in a 401k or in an annuity, you can now set them up because that's what they were there for. They're there. Your 401k and your annuities are there to provide income later on in life, right? That's right. why we, so Um, uh, this is also that we've been doing a lot of people because they're not taking distributions out of their, out of their retirement account, because they don't need them. They don't need them because they don't, they don't have that extra payment. And so when I get a client that's over 59 and a half, I always say, well, do you have money in a retirement in an IRA or an annuity? Oh yeah. yeah, I have like $500,000 in my, (laughs) in my retirement account. I'm like, oh, um, all right, well, we can set up a distribution, um, on that of three thousand dollars, so now we have income coming in, um, income coming in to to cover that new payment. Offset that payment, yeah, that payment. yeah. And That's so um, they just weren't thinking about it like that. They were thinking all I all I have is this income to qualify, but really they had more. I mean, there are some asset depletion loans too that we can do, but that one is super easy. And that one is, uh, that, that one we've used multiple times, especially because a lot of people are buying the second homes down here, you know, in Florida or investment properties or a new primary residence. Right, right. That age group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, good. Well, the point being is there are a lot of different ways to get this done. And what I love about working with Christine and her team is that they do think outside the box. Uh, they've got a lot of solutions for you. If there is, you know, further questions that you guys have, if there are any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. You know how to get a hold of me. I'm going to put Christine's information up here on the screen as well. And I want to thank you so much, Christine, for your time today. Thank you for flexing to my schedule with my computer problems that I was having today. And I'll um, I'll look forward to getting this on the air. I'll send you a link, and I will talk with you soon. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, I hope we covered all of the questions that you might have about financing your new home. I know moving to another state or another city can be pretty overwhelming and I am here to help you. So if you are considering a move to the Tampa Bay area, do not hesitate to reach out. You can give me a call, send me a text, shoot me an email, 
However you wanna communicate with me is fine. When it comes to moving to Tampa, I'm always available, I've got your back. Hey, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, ring the little bell so you'll be notified every time that I release a new video. And if you've got any other additional questions, feel free to leave them below in the comments section as well. I'll be sure to answer them as quickly as I can. But again, don't hesitate to give me a call. I'm always happy to speak with people that are considering a move to Tampa. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.